Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at passive detection and targeting. Now we've talked about electronic support measures before and basically the concept is, is if you send out an electronic signal, somebody can read that electronic signal and use it to basically figure out where you are, not to mention the details of that electronic signal. Now what I have here is a pretty straightforward setup. I have my lovely little Iceland here. We have ourselves of course an F-16, of course we also have an Iskander up in the northeast corner there. And what I'm noticing is I'm picking up an electronic signal from a radar that's down in the ocean. Now, we're, this is a surface-based facility. As a matter of fact, if I were to left-click on it real quick, I could actually see all the possible contact reports. It looks like it could be a BP-37 or one of the Big Bird B radars. It's a 5N64 Sierra there. Now, we know that this radar is out here somewhere along this vector. Now, using some quick common sense here, uh, unless it's a floating radar, it's pretty safe to assume that this radar is somewhere on the landmass here. Now, really, really smart intelligence people know the fact that when you plant light radars, you try to put them up high. So what I'd probably do is I get a topo map out. I try to find the highest mountain. You know, I try to look for something that looks secure, and that's probably where I would guess where the radar site is. But the reality is, if we want to engage this target, we don't have a good enough quality lock to actually do this. Now, the other thing you're probably saying is, but we're detecting the signal. Is it possible to just triangulate it between two different units? Sure. Let me show you what happens when we do that. So I'm going to grab myself a copy of the F-16 because, you know, life is better with F-16. And I'll go ahead and I'll unpause real quickly here. And you'll notice that we've shrunk the ambiguity substantially. Now you're sitting there saying, why aren't we getting an exact location? Well, let me show you the problem here. So let's say, for example, that I have myself a detector. How about that? And when you take a beam of something, it always has a fixed width to it. Now let's say we have a beam that's, um, you know, this width here. And let's say, you know, we're right at the location and we're trying to detect a target. Now, if our target is this wide compared to the beam, we're very confident about the position of that target. We might even be able to predict how big the target is. Now, what happens is as you move farther out, we start to create ambiguity. Now, if we have the same size target at this distance, we can only detect the target when our beam is touching it. We don't know where in the beam the target is. So theoretically, it could be all the way up to this edge and it could be all the way down to this edge. Now this ambiguity gets worse as the range increases. So when they design attack radars, the kind that actually guide weapons, they tend to have teeny tiny wavelengths so that they are not actually, they can have that too, teeny tiny beam widths in order to make it so they're more likely to actually detect the target precise enough to, you know, guide a missile right into them, kind of a thing like that. Now we have the same problem in reverse. So we have our radar that's sending signals, you know, in every single direction here. When we receive that signal, remember we're receiving a beam of that signal. Now if we're chilling here like this and we have four antennas hanging out of the side of our airplane like that, we detect the signal any time that we're touching the signal, which now means this arc is our new arc of ambiguity. So instead of going this way, you're going that way. Now you probably noticed here as when we looked at a little F-16, we had something that was shaped kind of like this initially. Now when we added the second F-16, you'll notice we got something that was shaped like this. Now our new possible locations became somewhere inside of the intersection. Now if we go back over to command, ah, you can see without a doubt that's exactly what happened here. Now people are saying, is this going to be good enough to actually take a shot? Um, what if you added a third F-16? Now, keep in mind, these are nice F-16s, and uh, one of the things they have on board is they actually have the HTS. Now, for those of you not familiar with the HTS, so what the HTS does is it allows you to uh, target harm missiles very, very accurately, and you can actually see it has one of these pods. Now, this particular thing is not a newbie pod. This is a very sophisticated tool for detecting items directly. It's a very, very, very slick system. Uh, for those of you who are DCS fans, you probably fist with this thing at some point. It works great. So you're saying, well, if all that high technology, highfalutin ESM, can we get a more precise target? Or can we just take the shot? Well, let's get a more precise target. So I'm going to grab myself a third F-16. Now at this point, you're saying, okay, three F-16s should be more than enough to give us a firing solution. Well, not really, no. So as you can see, uh, what we've done is we've created this nice little triangle of certainty here. Uh, those of you who are navigator types, you've seen this triangle so many times, it's not even funny. But all we've done here is we've confirmed its position. Remember, our F-16 still has the same size detector square, even though it is significantly far away. Now, is this going to be good enough? Now, some people are like, well, can you just run the scenario for a minute and see if uh, we can get a better answer? Oh, uh, marginally. And the reason we're getting a marginally better detection here is on account of the fact that we're getting progressively closer to it. Now, if you go back to my Microsoft Paint, my little John Madden action, you probably observed that because the radar beam gets tighter as you get closer, we are more confident about its position. 
Now, our F-16 right now is uh, 62 nautical miles away, which is pretty substantial. But we should have enough accuracy now to actually take the shot, so to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, guess where these guys are. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and assume it's right in the middle here. Control F1, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop the hammer, so to speak. And I'm also going to go ahead and delete my F-16s here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete their waypoints. I want them to orbit until um, such time I actually need them again. So let's grab them all. Oop. <laughs> I don't know why they changed that. Maybe this is setting in the options I changed somewhere. Most likely, that's what I did. All right, let's go ahead and unpause for a second. So Ms. Condor is uh, going to get those missiles going on the way. Remember, we're firing at an ambiguous target that we used with four targeting F-16s. Now, that's a pretty tight probability here. I mean, if I look at this, this is a mile wide of probability here, almost in both directions. So it's not a bad probability, but <laughs> in case you didn't notice, I missed. So uh, we need a much more precise shot to actually be able to take that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my F-16s. I'm going to move them a little bit closer. Let's see here. We want to be about 30 miles away. should be more than close enough. And we'll order my F-16s uh, to get a little bit closer. That looks pretty good there. Go ahead and find those 30 miles from here. Uh, 30 miles is not a made-up number, by the way. It actually makes a lot of sense. And we'll grab this guy, and we're going to go ahead and move him in here, too. Let's check my 30 miles. Uh, it's a little bit too close. Back it up just a little bit. All right, nice. So I'm going to order my F-16s to move in. And you immediately noticed that I was able to acquire the target to an extreme level of precision. And you probably also noticed I've identified the target. Now you're sitting there going, isn't that so sophisticated? Isn't it great that your radars could do that? Not so fast. As a matter of fact, um, if we actually go up here, we'll realize that this unit here was actually identified visually. It wasn't a target that we identified by our ESM. So unfortunately, our F-16s in their infinite brilliance, even though it's literally the middle of the night, had no difficulty seeing that target. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the weather a little bit to uh, deny them the uh, pleasure, so to speak, there. That should do that. Let's go ahead and drop them as a target. Let's go ahead. Oop, I'm going to go ahead and drop the target. Am I in God's eye view? There we go. Oh, cool. Unpause. So now I have to give these guys a minute to reacquire, but notice we lost the target completely once I cranked up the clouds here because now those sneaky visual sensors uh, don't do much to us. So let's see how much certainty we have. Um, this guy needs to get a lot closer here. Hey, Chief. Um... 30 miles, man, 30 miles. That's what I was asking for. Boop, there, it's a little bit closer. We'll give him a second to, uh, to confirm his position. Again, HTS is a very, very precise system. This is not some 1970s, woohoo, YOLO, kind of a detection mechanism. And you can quote me on that if you need. So now that we've gotten substantially closer, let's see what it's done to our uncertainty. We're a mile wide still. That's not enough. And as you probably noticed by me raining a bunch of missiles down in that location, nothing happened. Now, some of you, of course, will immediately say, well, why don't you just rain a pattern on missiles rather than just eight missiles into the same spot? Yeah, you're right. We could certainly have tried that. But a mile wide is still pretty big, even for the Iskander. Of course, if we're dealing with nuclear weapons, I just need to know what state it's in and I can uh, evaporate it. Now, notice as we're getting closer and closer, our little range of uh, probabilities gets smaller. We're down to a half a mile by about a half a mile, now about a third of a mile. That's actually pretty good probabilities right there. Now, of course, you're saying, what if you added another F-16? Well, you can do that too if you like, but um, I think you're going to be slightly disappointed in the results here. Uh, this one's actually going to have to bisect this one in order to have an appropriate little thing there. There we go. So we'll give everybody a few moments to kind of uh, zero in. and I'm feeling pretty confident now. And now you can see without a doubt that we actually are pretty darn sure of the range that this target is in. Uh, my maximum range this way is, I think I've got it down to, uh, what is that, 0.1. Maximum range this way is about 0.4. <gasps> Pause. I'm going to go ahead and mark that. <laughs> I'm going to mark the position. Uh, the reason I'm positioning this is in the event that I'm not confident, but that should be more than close enough. And again, look at how close my F-16s are. They're about five, eight miles away here. That's, that's not, not very much. All right, Mr. Iskander, I need you again. Let's go zoom in a little tiny bit here, and uh, we will pepper this pattern with uh, the light remaining missiles. All right, you're going to get a missile. I'm going to not so confidently fire a missile there. I'm going to not so confidently fire a missile there. And I'm not going to confidently fire a missile in that direction either. All right, do your thing. Fire. That's the sound it should make, like a little grenade launcher. Whee! Now our F-16s, of course, are going to like pinpoint. All right, let's see if we succeeded. Ah, <laughs> I'd say we got them. <laughs> Now, as you know, our actual position was a little bit to the west there, but uh, nice. So you can see, without a doubt, we were able to engage that target. Now, the thing you have to remember, too, is that was a very cooperative target. It wasn't shooting at us. It wasn't dodging funny. It wasn't doing anything along those lines. And, of course, it was emitting. If it wasn't emitting, that would have been a much more challenging target to kind of detect. So usually at this point, people say, okay, so obviously with manual attacks, if you get within eight miles with a really good sensor, even with bad weather like we have now, 
um, we're still able to actually engage the target fairly successfully. So the concept does work with late 2000s technology. So uh, what I want to demonstrate real quickly here is just so everybody can realize that this is not a panacea, is the fact that if we were to reopen the scenario again, and I'll go ahead and grab my F-16 and remove it, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab myself an F-5E. Uh, it helps if you actually type in F-5E, I suppose. That looks pretty good. A Tiger Three. This is like the nice one. Grab some Pythons. Let's go over here and go to sensors. We're going to go ahead and add a receiver. Uh, we're going to make it a nice modern, not really sonar. We'll do 1970s. Oh, yeah. This is going to be disappointing. Simple ESM. Watch this. I'm actually going to have to remove these two because if I leave them on there, they're going to be so good, it's going to actually make it obvious. All right, let's go ahead and unpause for a second here. All right. There we go. Look at the cone of uncertainty on that technology. And again, as I was demonstrating before, so we're actually going to grab ourselves three F5s. Go ahead and unpause. And you can see with the three F5s, uh, we at least know it's somewhere in Iceland where this radar actually exists. And you can see this is not going to be nearly good enough track, even though we are, like I said, we're relatively confident here. Again, we can arrange it. Now, it's another thing that we don't see in a command very often is the fact that the antennas that detect these signals are in different parts of an aircraft and sometimes have different sensitivities and sometimes have different, you know, kind of tolerances for things being underneath, so to speak. But you can see with my little uh, kind of cone of uncertainty here, even with this 1970s uh, detection technology, I'm not great, but I'm also not bad. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit here so we can uh, go ahead and see if we can get a good enough shot there. Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm not Wicked confident, but I'm confident enough to take the shot here. So let's go grab ourselves our SS-26 one more time. And let's see what is our width here. Ugh. This is going to be a lot of peppering. I wish it had a little mark on the ground that told you where your manual attacks were. That would be so convenient right now. And again, I'm just going to pepper this entire region as about the best I can. Let's see here. It looks pretty good there. And it looks pretty good there. I think I've allocated eight at this point. Uh, eight. Sweet. Fire. All right, my friends, the Iskanders, let's see how close we get this time. Remember, this is just with 1970s technology. This isn't anything fancy or like well deployed or anything like that. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, I hate to say it, but uh, he's fine. As a matter of fact, if I switch teams, you'll see that it took absolutely zero damage. So I just was not pretty nice enough. So now what's my big kind of end conclusion here? The end conclusion here is it is completely possible to engage with these sorts of attacks with a manual. Uh, the key thing is there's probably better ways. Uh, for example, if I load this up real fast, I'll go ahead and grab green team one more time. You can couple the two different technologies together. Like if I were to grab, um, actually let's grab something a little bit better at this. Let's grab myself an F-18. Now I'll grab an E model here. F -A -A. It helps if you actually type it in properly. If I grab myself an E, United States Navy, we'll go ahead and grab ourselves uh, Argum. Why not? Because I'm a jerk. We'll delete this guy. We'll go ahead and point him this way. We'll unfreeze. We'll also flip on his radar real quick. Boop, boop. There we go. Now we have a nice fancy phased array radar, and we've identified the target's position and what kind of emissions they have. That's going to be the best if you really, really, really want to save ammunition. Otherwise, a straight-up ESM attack, while it's possible, is very challenging. Enjoy.